Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Glass bullet. Hi, yo. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to get this out of the way. Wait, sorry. That's rude. Welcome to the Butterfly House Podcast. I am your host, Osaze Akaraja, the hostess with the mostess, the court jester, bringing you the pressure, giving you none lesser. Yes, sir. People, first, before we continue this, as you know, last week I had a mistake, an error, and um, I was recording with no audio. So I'm going to turn around for a second. I am filming this. Turn it around, checking the audio. Hey, and we're good money. We are flying. All right. Before we even continue any further, I know a lot of uh, a lot a lot of pre-podcast house cleaning to get out of the way. I'm a little tired today. I smoked weed earlier today. And don't you sit there and you judge me. It was a beautiful day outside today. Gorgeous day. The sun was shining. All of the flower petals were just, were just so vibrant. You can see the, the, the grass looked like neon, baby. It was nice. So with that being said, if there are moments when I sound a little out of it, man, well, now you get why. I will end the speculation. I will end the questioning. But anyway, how are you? Are you doing okay? I'll, I'll, I'll take a moment to hear the responses off in the distance in the future upon you guys hearing this podcast on a Wednesday. Are you guys digging the Wednesdays? You know, you have something to look forward to pretty much every Wednesday at 8 a.m. I want to find a way to, uh, I guess, solicit questions. You know, I can get, uh, I can take some questions from, from people listening. We've got a few people checking in kind of regularly. It's pretty nice. We got people checking in on all the different platforms. So lovely. If you do like what you hear, I don't, I don't know the nature of promoting podcasts, but if you like what you hear, I don't know, tell a buddy, tell a buddy to tell a buddy, tell your mother, tell your stepfather, tell your tech savvy grandfather, tell everybody, tell your ex-girlfriend. Maybe that could be the way that you guys reconcile. You, you come to her, you say, look, I found this podcast of this, you know, kind of semi-crazy yet wildly charismatic artist dude who kind of rants about philosophy. Maybe we could uh, meet together and, uh, you know, check it out together and uh, we could start making out and, uh, you know, we can get back together and, uh, you know, we can have some children and uh, get a divorce 20 years ago. No, I'm just kidding, people. Thank you. For all your support. Talking about support. Last week. Last week was a banner week. For the butterfly house. For the butterfly man. I put out a record on Wednesday. It got covered in the press. Which is nice. Some online press from New York. Uh, musician press. Which is nice. Starting to get picked up by some playlists. Which is nice. You know it wasn't that nice. Got some, uh, got some rejections from some publications and playlists, and it's interesting reading. What I like is that they reject you and they tell you why, you know. Um, the thing that, that took me by surprise was there was one playlist or one curator who didn't want to pick up the record because he said, or she, or they claimed that the record is too commercial. And in a way, I, I, I've never been more complimented by a rejection in my life. Because making things, quote, quote, commercial isn't typically what I would associate my creative process with. I would describe myself as kind of a, an, approachable, uh, an, an approachable eccentric. You know, I'm going to do some things that are kind of, you know, kind of um, intriguing or, or left of center but I feel like it'll still be approachable. Commercial feels like it's on the other end of the spectrum, but I'll take it. Shit, maybe it may, may mean the butterfly man got mass appeal. The butterfly man got mass appeal. Um, so that was cool. And then 
in promotion for the record night before. Went out, did a nice little set in the Lower East Side. Manhattan, what's going on? Reporting live from Brooklyn. And uh, it was fine. I mean, something that I have to really drill into my head, people, is that I do not do well on stage if I'm too inebriated. You know, I haven't, I haven't unlocked that degree of rock starness in my, uh, in my repertoire. Um, but the funny thing is that if I have, if I have a certain amount of alcohol, that, 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 that sweet, that sweet spot of inebriation, then I feel like, then I feel like it, it adds something a little extra to the equation. That is a, that's a solid thing. Um, that kind of amplifies things, or at least it kind of helps me take the edge off, which I think then um, brings out a new level of stage charisma. But, but we are not going to advocate for alcohol abuse here. The key to life, right, one of the keys, should be being able to handle everything without any, like, outside influence. You know, being able to move through life without needing to be fucked up. You know, and I think I touched on this maybe last week or the week before, how, you know, in college, you know, feeling like a socially awkward kid, you know, trying to get out in the scene, man, you know? So what do I do, man? You know, I go to the, I go to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fucking, the fucking frat parties, you know? And then I go in the basement and, and I have to, I'm, I'm immediately looking for the alcohol. You know, or, or, or when you, you know, that, that's back in the day when you pregame, you know, you pregame. I used to have to smuggle Everclear from Jersey up to Boston. Hell yeah, I'm a fucking pirate. Get up there, taking shots of Everclear, half shots of Everclear, sometimes so desperate, chasing it with fucking granola. Word to the wise, never chase a liquid with a solid. Not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not a good time. Um... Anywho, go out. That's how I'm able to talk to the ladies. That's how I'm able to schmooze the femininas. Because I'm a little fucked. And I do feel like over the years, I've shed that. I've shed that a little bit. You know? Um, I find that, you know, my favorite drug. Because alcohol is a drug, people. Just because it's marketed in a certain kind of way that people kind of think it's just, oh, it's just a beverage. No, no, no. It fucks you up. It makes you feel things. makes you stop feeling other things. makes you move through the life in a different kind of way. Excuse your vision. makes you make bad decisions. That sounds like a drug to me. Anyway, my favorite drug. I am a fan of the psychedelics. Specifically, I like LSD. Shrooms are okay but I prefer the LSD. Now, I want to also say this. When it comes to favorite drugs, I would say that, see, weed, weed is a, is a kind of drug that you're able to do every day. You know, not that you should. You know, I think everything in moderation, balance, right? You enjoy things more when you don't do them all the time. But weed is a drug that I feel like if you smoked it every day, you'd be able to function. I feel like if you trip all the fucking time. I can't, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like it would melt your brain. But also, wait, wait, wait. Let me reel that back in. Part of what makes psychedelics cool is that if you, if you trip on them too often, right, the effect wears off. And I think psychedelics are the kind of thing that you're not really taking them just to kind of mellow out like you would do weed. Now, if you're taking psychedelics, you kind of want an experience, man. You want an experience. You want to travel through the universe, right? You want to traverse the cosmos, right? So with that being said, you're probably, it's, you're better off spacing those out, you know? Um, and, you know, psychedelics are the kind of thing where I feel like it's super unwise to ever peer pressure someone into taking them because I think a big part of the enjoyment of a psychedelic experience is the fact that you want to go on that journey. Um, 
because I think to go against that, you might end up in a very, very sensitive place and then get knocked over the edge into everyone's dreaded thing, the bad trip. And you don't want that. I've had maybe one or two bad trips in my day. They are not pleasant. I like to think that a bad trip makes me see the other side of madness, right? It's kind of like a difference between wandering into a waking nightmare or a good trip, which is like wandering through um, a euphoric kind of dream, you know? Um, so it's very context-based, you know, who, who you trip with, um, what kind of music is there with you, um, the weather, how clean your, your space is, how much control you have over the environment you're in, which sounds like a lot of things to have a grip on, but not really. I mean, that, that's kind of why I like, you know, going to a park with a speaker and a couple of buddies, some food. And you trip there. And yes, you don't have full control over the environment. A fucking turkey can come running at you, but, you know, likelihood of, I think you're going to be okay, you know. Um, I remember, I think, I would say my first bad trip happened when I was in, it was in 2014, right? And then I was tripping with a buddy of mine and a woman that he introduced me to. And um, I remember, we, you know, and the night before, the night before this trip, me and the woman had, uh, you know, canoodled as, uh, you know, we, uh, you, you know, you know, you, 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 you could read between the lines. Um, so the, ne the next day, she's still there. And then we decided to trip with this buddy of mine. And then, you know, first, you know, things started, our, things started off on a bad, on, a, on the wrong foot when, when they put on a, a Ray Shremard you know, uh, the, the, the no flex zone chaps. They put on Ray Schremmerd. And I, I, I got nothing against Ray Schremmerd. You know, I, I like them in, in, in certain places. You know, if I'm out in a nightclub, I love Ray Schremmerd. But I find during a uh, very sensitive, emotional, psychedelic journey, I could, uh, I, I, I could do without the Ray Schremmerd. That kind of sets things off onto, you know, a, 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 a harsh mellow for me. And then at some point, he, all, he, he then turns and he asks her, uh, why, why don't you take your clothes off? And then she replies, what? And then he says, what? <laughs> like, almost, almost like trying to almost like trying to repaint what reality just occurred five minutes ago, you know, um, which is kind of funny now you think about it. I wonder if you could do that. I wonder if you could do that in any other circumstance. It's like you're in a meeting with your boss and you're just like, you're an asshole. And then they say, what? You say, what? Maybe just, it, maybe just the, the jarring moment of confusion would make, would make a person just say, I, I don't want to be involved with this and we can just move on and, and not acknowledge the previous moment. I don't know. Maybe if it, if, it, if it is all a simulation, man, what are the cheat codes, man? Um, anywho, that kind of began the bad trip. And I remember at some point going in the bedroom by myself, listening to some music and the speaker knocked the OxyClean powder all over my laptop and the bed that was terrible. And the, 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 the dog that was in the apartment kind of low key started attacking everyone in the apartment. So we let the dog out, the dog runs away. After the trip, someone calls and they actually found the dog, dog comes back. It just felt like total chaos. There was another funny moment doing a, doing a trip with a, a girlfriend of mine a couple of years ago. And uh, I don't know, the song that was playing, it was a good song, which is something about it in the moment ended up making things feel like a torture chamber. We were trying to paint and we were trying to open up the, uh, you know, the little whatever the thing, the thing that holds the paint, you know, the little, that little plastic with the little, with the little rut that you have to kind of pull the other piece of plastic over. You know what I'm talking about. You know what the fuck I'm talking about. So we tried to open that and we couldn't. And we couldn't, and the song, it sounded kind of like, like, we're, like we were in a demented circus or like a demented carnival game. Um, again, funny in retrospect. 
Um, geez, I had another. I had another bad trip. This was uh, last year. I just started like pondering violence. And again, I want to preface this by saying I'm not a violent person. You know, I haven't been in a fight since the third grade, brother. Um, and you know, I'm 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 typically a peaceful person. But I, I, I you know I contemplate things. I think about a lot of things. So I thought about what it would be like to like go through with a murder or to like to go through with one of those dramatic stories you'd see on the news of like a murder suicide incident and I remember it was just awful like I didn't want to go in the dark basement to get my phone or get anything to write with it was just whew. again I feel like I saw the the other side of madness um and the the moment that broke it from being horrifying was I was sitting in a chair and I just kind of thought about what it'd be like to actually, you know, lunge, lunge at someone, you know, like to, <laughs> to, to lunge at somebody with violent intent. And then at that point, it just, I don't know, something about it became funny because it just seemed silly. Um, but, you know, good trips that have happened, I find that they're, they're almost like mental and emotional exercises, you know, like coming to conclusions about dissolving insecurity or dissolving paranoia, which, as you recall, oh, Easter egg for all the consistent listeners, insecurity and paranoia are what? Uh, um, the pillars of my despair. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, and then, you know, I've had trips that make me contemplate reality in a different way that kind of makes me approach life a little differently. Um, you know, because I, I think... Life can get kind of depressing if you think of the tangible world as all that there is. So I think having these moments that bring you into, um, I guess, deeper understanding with different types of possibilities in terms of how existence works, that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, I often postcard a lot when I do trips. So like I'll write down a bunch of different shit. If anyone ever comes to my studio, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, note cards hanging up with a lot of you know, a lot of, I guess, reminders to keep close to the chest. A lot of those come from acid trips, man. Um, and of course, just, you know, music, like the way that music sounds, the different layers that I'll end up hearing. Um, I don't know. You just come away with a lot of clarity and some lingering euphoria, which I appreciate. Um, but again, not for everybody. I think, you know, in terms of drugs and drug use, I think it's common that people say that when they get in their old age, they want to try, like, a lot of drugs. And my response to that is, well, duh. I mean, I feel like that's when they're probably the most fun. That's when things probably feel the lowest stakes. But you know, I guess on the flip side, you know, you know, that first time that you, you know, the first time that you bang some Prumani while you're fucking high out of your mind in your youth. Man, that shit, that shit, that shit's a game changer. Because I imagine, you know, you're like an 86-year-old guy. It's probably not going to, it's one, it might be hard for you to actually, you know, find some 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 willing sexual participants <laughs> but also you know you getting the rod all the way up at full attention it's more of a gamble it's not much of a gamble when you're 21 years old when you're 18 years old oh man i remember the first time i remember the first time i got high man i remember the first time i got high when i was in college i smoked a little J. And I remember going upstairs, man, man, doing things to that girl, man. And I remember we put on a song, man. That song sounded like it was 20 minutes long, man. It was a great night. <sighs> but, I th you know, I think you have this period. You have periods in your life, preferably early on, where you go a little too hard with things. You haven't quite learned moderation, you know. And at learning moderation, it's such a critical, it's such a critical thing. You know, uh, I think the first time I ever got too hammered, again, college story, I remember it was like the end of finals, so obviously we had to celebrate, right? It's finals, we have to celebrate. 
And I remember uh, linking up in my room there. I'm going to, by the way, carpeted floors. Carpeted floors. I want you to remember that. There's carpeted floors in my dorm room. So this woman comes in, you know, she starts pouring shots. I believe it was Smirnoff. Probably the one with the, it was one of the berry ones. Tasted very berry. And uh, I want to say we pounded down maybe six shots in about 30 minutes. Now, I don't know. Now, you hearing that, you might think that I'm a total lightweight or you might be saying to yourself, holy fuck. Either way, I don't know. It was my first time really drinking like to that extent. Lo and behold, it hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. I started running around the hallway going into, into people's rooms, yelling things. I remember at points there were parents visiting, obviously, to take their kids home because finals is done. I remember people trying to hide me in different rooms because I was a wrecking ball. I was just going around like a wrecking ball. And then the finale of the evening came, folks. The finale of the evening. I remember just sitting... You know, you know when you feel like you're about to throw up, you feel all the, you know, that rush of saliva coming into your mouth and you're just like, ah. it, you know, mentally you're like, I can fight this. I can beat this. And we're sitting on my bed, looking at the window. And then underneath the window, there is this radiator covered with wood planks, long wood planks. And it was almost like I was trying to grill grits. I just threw up all over that thing, man. And then I rolled over, threw up on the, at the head of my bed. And then I laid down, and then I sat up again, and I looked across by the door on the opposite side of the window. I saw the garbage can there. Felt bubbling in my guts once again. And I remember saying, I can make it to the, I can make it to the gar 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 garbage. I can make it to the garbage. I can't make it to the garbage. And then just threw up at my feet there. Now, what did I say at the beginning of the story? Carpeted floors. I pass out, wake up. You can imagine what that room smelled like. Horrific. And then I, I, I walked outside. First of all, I felt, I felt what a hangover was like for the first time. That was interesting. It did feel kind of like a rite of passage. Kind of like a rite of passage. Um, walked out the room. It took me an unreasonably long time to walk down the hallway. Like I, was, I was just very thrown off. It's like if my brain was an electronic device, someone hit it with an EMP. You know, it just felt fucked. Um, and then what's worse is that the entire hallway smelled like my vomit. Ah, it was brutal. So that's when I also learned the collateral damage of alcohol abuse, you know. And, that, and then collateral damage goes all the way up the scale. There's stinking up the hallway of your fucking, you know, college dorm room. And then there's making a fool of yourself at the office Christmas party and smacking the secretary on the butt and getting called in for sexual harassment the next day and losing your fucking job. And your wife finds out about it, too. And you lose the house. So there's a spectrum. There's, there's a bit of a spectrum. Um... And people, you know, obviously I wanted to come in more lighthearted, but it does feel very imperative to say this. The Supreme Court, go fuck yourself. And I mean that with my whole chest. You know, I heard a conspiracy theory over the weekend now, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that fly around. People pass them around like trading cards. And, and you know, you never know which ones to believe. You know, you know that a lot of them are bullshit, but also part of you is like, well, some stuff might be real, which I think is totally reasonable to think. I heard a, I heard a, I heard a, a conspiracy theory that I think might have a little water now. So I heard, I heard that white people are the people who get the most abortions, all right? Now, whether that's proportionately speaking or just because white people are the majority in the country, don't know. 
but I've heard that. And then what I also heard is that because of that, that is why there's this push to stop abortions because you have a, you know, a very vocal group of people who feel or that are worried about minorities becoming the majority. So there's you know, the, this urge to, I guess, extend, <laughs> extend the lead that the white man has on uh, all the other races. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, I get it, because that sounds fucking nuts. But I don't remember her name, but some uh, woman who's in Congress running for re-election, she actually, Trump was at her rally, and she said she wants to thank Trump for um, a victory for white life. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, the, the, it's so blatant, not even hiding it. So then with her saying that, it's, I mean, it's hard to pinpoint what the, what the total motive behind this thing would be. Like, what's this cabal of people who want to make this happen? But her saying that lets you know that that's what a lot of people, or that's what some people are at least thinking about this. That's what is possible for a person to think about this. And that, my friend, is very, very, very scary shit. You know, and seeing the court weaponized in this kind of way, it does open the floodgate of like, where, where, where else are we going to go? You know, what else is going to be outlawed? What will be instituted? I don't know. And this is just further evidence in my case, ladies and gentlemen, that we are witnessing the gradual not sure how steep of a slope, but we are witnessing the gradual fall of humanity. So enjoy the ride. <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, the cynic in me, now, first of all, I, you know, it's very, very, it's heartwarming to see how many people took to the streets already in protest right away. You know, like, this is an issue that enraged people. Um, what I thought was interesting is I believe in their statement about this decision, they mentioned that, you know, abortion has become such a divisive issue in this country that they, they figured this would help remove some of that divisive nature by removing it from a federal conversation. And it's like, dude, you thought you would make it less divisive and make things quieter? Nonsense. Nonsense. Go fuck yourself, go fuck yourself, twice over. But I do have to ask, and I don't know if this is playing devil's advocate or just, just, just asking a question, just asking a question. And I've kind of always wondered this whenever they happen. What, what is like, what is the reason for protests? I believe the main reason would be to vocalize collectively your frustration with something. My only worry, or the thing that I wonder, is, you know, it, does it have any, like, effect? Like, what, like, in this case, what would protests do? What kind of ripples could they create? Um, and that's just what worries me, is that if, they, if they're not able to actually do anything, not because people shouldn't mobilize, but rather the, a lot of these motherfuckers in Washington seem a little heartless. They seem like they, they wouldn't have their moral standpoint switched over by, wow, those people seem angry. No, they seem like they don't give a fuck. It's, it reminds me of, they used to have this meme where it's like you, you put some kind of like corny play on words and then the meme is like a picture of Squidward running away with like his hands kind of dainty, like, oh, I got you. Like it's kind of, you hit send and then run, get the fuck out of Dodge. That's kind of what it, what it feels like these people do. And also the fact that, you know, motherfuckers are kind of on their way out. They're older people. They're older people. So incentive to preserve the next generation or rather to help the, the next generation, uh, there's not as much incentive. So they're selfish douchebags. Um, 
you know, I hope that this isn't the fall of humanity. I hope it's not. You know, I hope that we continue to persist and find new ways to rise above. Um, a boy can dream, baby. Um, and, you know, keep on jamming. You know, if, if it is all going downhill, I feel like my favorite metaphor, I feel like I'm one of the musicians on the Titanic. What can I do but just keep playing, you know? Um, and, you know, with that, I guess in, in these very woeful times, what makes you feel as though there's hope? You know, what do you do to keep yourself hopeful, optimistic, you know, rose-colored glasses on? What do, you, what do you do to help with that, you know? I think a big thing you can do is try to at least work on your health. You know, at least that, that way you have this kind of base level of... Um, you know, well-wired inter internal circuitry, I guess, that can help you withstand shitty things when they come your way, because they're going to come your way, you know. <sighs> I don't know. But, um, you know, I wish everybody luck. Um, let me do a quick time check. Oh, and we made it past our half hour. Um... I, w I really want to know when you people listen to this, by the way. Do you listen to it when you're getting ready to go to work, during the commute headed to work? Do you check it out during your lunch break? Someone told me that they check it out when they go for runs, which I thought was interesting. Because um, I, like I feel like I'm too smooth. I feel like I'm too smooth to hype you up. You know what I'm saying? But no, no, just, you know, happy again with all the support. Um... I guys, I will leave you with this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I will leave you with this other piece of information. I have a show coming up on July 11th here in Manhattan. Tickets are 15. That includes a five-dollar drink ticket at the Parkside Lounge. Parkside Lounge. I will be at the Parkside Lounge in Manhattan Monday, July 11th. Butterfly House. It's gonna be nice. Um, come out. You know, dance, sweat. Cry, nod your head, etc. Tell your friends, bring everybody that you know. Um, and again, it's you know I'm just really thankful to be back on stages again, um, working on new music for July. Stay tuned, and um, yeah, there's another announcement that I'll probably make next week. So stay tuned. You know, it's 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 gonna be a busy fucking summer. You know, perhaps a busy year. You know, at least we hope so. Um, Godspeed. God bless you. I'll talk to you next week. And uh, again, be kind to the person next to you on the train today because we're all just down here trying to figure it out. You know, okay, now I'm officially done. Bye. <laughs>